All right, I think I'm live. So this is a uh, live stream I'm doing in sort of um, anticipation and, and to some degree a celebration of the Phenomenology of Spirit course, which is starting um, in two days, uh, January 15th. Um, our first course, our first live session together will be on January 15th, covering the forward. Um, and that starts at 7 p.m. Central uh, European time. So this is a live stream where basically I am going to ask any, answer any questions or, or entertain any, any conversations uh, that may emerge in the chat. Um, and I'll pretty much stay doing this for as long as there are people um, interested in me doing this. Um, I also have some some slides previewing some of the uh, the intro material of the course, which I might uh, go into a little bit if if uh, people are interested or if the questions are um, not uh, you know not not really flowing, and I feel like I need to to actually talk about something. <laughs> so I'm not just. Uh, on this live sort of by myself listening to my listening to myself so um yeah that's basically the gist um feel free to to ask anything to uh, ask anything about the course to ask anything about hegel as a philosopher to ask anything about the phenomenology of spirit you might be curious about um uh, you can also ask about my own personal relationship to philosophy. You can also ask about my own personal relationship to reading the phenomenology of spirit. Um, my history in academia, how to relate to academia, um, anything in that general direction. Um, so I've already got a question coming in and, and also this is live streaming on YouTube as well as Facebook. So I'm going to be asking, answering some questions, which will all only be showing up in the the Facebook stream. Um, I'll get I'll get to that uh, as well. So the first question I do have one coming in from Facebook, which says, uh, "Would you mind rehashing the singularity bit?" And also said, "Would love to know more about your academic journey." Um, for the person who asked about the singularity bit, can you further clarify what you mean about the singularity bit? I'm assuming you're talking about the technological singularity. That's something I um, did my PhD thesis on. Um, so if you clarify that question a little bit, I can I can uh, go into that a little bit in more detail. Um, and then someone uh, uh, else asked, uh, would, would love to know more about your academic journey. Well, my, my academic journey... Um, well, if we start at the beginning of what I consider sort of my entry into academia, um, it would start with me failing high school. Um, so I, I failed, long story short, I, I, I failed high school because I was totally invested in sports. Um, and then I went to a community college to study this general arts and science program, which basically gave me a, a, an introduction to all knowledge. You know, I studied biology, anthropology, chemistry, um, and then basically decided that I was interested in what it meant to be human. So the question of what it meant to be human really informed my entire academic journey. Um, and that led me into anthropology, led me into history. Uh, I was very interested in the origin of humans from a primatological, evolutionary, anthropological perspective. Um, and then eventually, after a lot of um, trial, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of a mess in my personal life, found myself more and more gravitating towards philosophy um, and interested in the human future. I can ask, I can answer a lot more about that if you're if you're interested more about my academic journey, but. There's a few more questions coming in. Um, so someone tried to clarify the singularity view, said, yes, your earlier views and where they stand from then to today on the singularity. So the singularity is near really impacted me a lot. Uh, the singularity is near is a book by Ray Kurzweil. Um, so the singularity is near book by Ray Kurzweil um, had a huge impact. I, I remember reading it and 
thinking, wow, this is very convincing. He was using sort of a scientific logic to extrapolate into the future. And I could basically sort of anticipate that how I understood reality uh, would be totally different in the future. Um, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, nanotechnology. And so uh, I, from that point of view, started to try to piece together my anthropological knowledge with futurist knowledge. Um, and uh, that really was the groundwork for the beginning of my PhD. Um, and then when I got into philosophy, my views on the singularity started to change quite a bit um, for many complex reasons, which I go into in my PhD thesis um, and which led me into becoming very interested in Hegel. Um, but one of the most central ideas um, as it relates to the singularity uh, is that in Hegelian philosophy, you can't really jump ahead of yourself into the future. So I became a lot more skeptical of people projecting visions into the future of what the future would be like and sort of trained myself to sort of be a student of the present, if that makes any sense. Um, and we can go into a little bit more about that, but I got a bunch of questions coming in. So the comrade asks a question. So the comrade, hello, the comrade. A question I have is, what you would recommend someone be familiar with before reading Hegel, if there is a reading list I could use to prepare? Um, well, I mean, I think that some familiarity with philosophy, um, I would say some familiarity with, I don't think it would hurt to have some familiarity with modern science, um, some familiarity with the, with, with what's being discussed today. Um, if you have a background in, in literature and modern science or, or, or pre-Hegelian philosophy, um, I think, you know, just being a generally well-read person, um, I think that will be very interesting because, um, in moving through Hegel, Hegel, at least in the phenomenology of spirit, and this is something I'm going to try to emphasize in the first slides of the course, is really kind of like a vanishing mediator meaning that he is um, an individual and the phenomenology in particular is a book which you immerse yourself in fully only to eventually let it go and basically train yourself to be a dialectical thinker. And then all of the things that you had read before Hegel or all of the things that you had read before the phenomenology of spirit will appear differently in retrospect. So I can give that example with my, my knowledge of the technological singularity. It's not so much that I'm not interested in the technological singularity anymore. It's simply that my perspective on it has changed. It's become more dialectical. It's become more phenomenological. Um, and a lot of that has to do with my engagement with, with Hegel. So I, I would just say, you know, to be a generally well-read person um, and to prepare to uh, going into Hegel to really immerse yourself in it. That's really what the point is. And the point is not to immerse yourself in it so that you're permanently identified with it, but to immerse yourself in it so that you can eventually let it go. It's really a, a process. And again, Hegel is like a vanishing mediator. So Gil Gamesh has a question. Gil Gamesh asks, guys like Slavoj Žižek say we need to return to Hegel. What does he mean by that? What does Hegel have to offer in our time? Well, the crucial thing is what does Hegel have to offer in our time? You know, Hegel, uh, Zizek has this funny joke of basically saying, you know, uh, it's not that Hegel, it's not that Hegel's dead. It's like we are dead in the eyes of Hegel and basically asking, you know, how would Hegel see the present moment? It's not so much, you know, at least from my point of view, mimicking or like memorizing everything that Hegel said, but rather sort of training yourself to see the present moment from the perspective of what Hegel's talking about with absolute knowing, and also training yourself to see the present from more of a dialectical perspective. And, and once you sort of have integrated the standpoint of absolute knowing, once you have sort of trained your mind to think with concepts in a dialectical process, um, I think that that radically changes the way we are with knowledge. So like a very precise, I think, and, and concise answer to your question would be, what does Hegel offer to our time is the mode or the way we are with knowledge. 
steps, I would say it's it's not so like we're in an age where knowledge is abundant. We're in an age where knowledge is like freely available and like Wikipedia, Google, you can you have access to knowledge. So the problem is not access to knowledge. The problem is the way we are with knowledge. And I think that that's what Hegel offers us is a, a really a, a, a profound relation to knowledge, which is not necessarily taught, especially in the Anglo philosophical tradition, not so much taught. And, and I think that a lot of people have a naive relationship to, um, to knowledge. So Raul Morrison asks, or Raul Morrison asks, hi, what would you say to those critiques of Hegel and his dialectic? Here I am thinking of Adorno, that it is totalizing in the sense that it explains everything. So I would actually recommend, so I have a substack that I just, uh, I have a substack that I just started. It's called Philosophy Portal. If you go to my website, philosophyportal.online, there's a link to my substack. And I just published an article that might help you with this question. The article is titled, Hegel is not a theory of everything. So in other words, and and if you read that article and you find it find it useful, then go go along and and or if you want more further explanation on this question, uh, a lot of my clarification on it came from reading Less Than Nothing uh, by Slavoj Žižek. So I also have quite a few videos on my YouTube channel about Less Than Nothing by Slavoj Žižek, which really get into this and um, Žižek has throughout that book basically the straw man and the iron man hegel so the straw man of hegel is basically this totalizing figure uh, and he actually has a specific reference to adorno where adorno says that hegel is the belly turned mind or the mind turned belly basically that hegel is the concept that eats everything hegel is the concept that brings everything into a sublation brings everything into a totality you know, sublates everything as a process. However, Zizek says that what this leaves out is that Hegel is not only eating, but also defecating. So you could say in relationship to Adorno, not only is Hegel the mind turned belly, but he's also the mind turned asshole or butthole, you know, because Hegel's also defecating, meaning that he's totalizing knowledge and then releasing it. So you I think when you're thinking dialectically and when you're thinking with the help of absolute knowing, you should never forget that there's also the release of concepts. There's also the letting go of concepts. It's not simply that you hold on to these concepts forever and strongly identify with them, um, although that is part of the process. So that's what I would say about the critiques of Hegel and his totalizing dialectic. Cassandra, I was quite impressed by how Mr. Bard is impressed by you. Uh, most important philosopher of his generation or something like that. Well, Bard, yeah, Bard, uh, well, Bard and I have been collaborating for a while. I um, have a very deep relationship with Alexander Bard. We're actually working on a book together. Um, and yeah, uh, I recommend checking out his his work as well. I recommend checking out his uh, podcast. I recommend checking out his books. Um, I think he is an underappreciated voice of our generation, and um, very important. He knows he knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. He's one of the few really original thinkers um, that really understands philosophy and is not just like an, an academic or an institutional mouthpiece. He is really like, he is a, I think he's a subject of absolute knowing. So I think that's a, a he's a, he's a, a person to listen to and uh, an interesting philosophical figure. Isaiah Holland, does anybody draw on analysis, an analysis between the revealed religion where the new gods are that which has control under those under its domain and cybernetics? Well, I'm going to have to sort of like, make sure I understand your question. I think the question is, does, is there an analysis between revealed religion and control, cybernetic control? Not sure what the question is. If you could further clarify your question, 
I see there's a, oh, you have a, so you have a, yeah, so you have another question. Maybe it's, maybe I can make better sense of it. In accordance to that, what do you think about Hegel as a proto-cybernetician? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I think it's an interesting question. The idea of the relationship between Hegel and cybernetics, maybe in particular higher order cybernetics. So like, for example, my PhD supervisor was actually a cybernetician. Um, and is was a is a world famous cybernetician. So I have some knowledge of the background in cybernetics. Um, Oftentimes, cybernetics is conceptualized as like something as sophisticated as physics, but for the social realm. And it focuses on communication and control. And it's like really about formalizing sort of communication and control in the social world. And it led to like basically the computer revolution and the information revolution. You know, I think that it's an incredibly interesting question. What is the relationship? Lost. So I hope I haven't lost a um, connection there. But that's the type of question I would encourage people in my course to explore to give an, to, to give an example of um, what I mean by that is that in the course, I think we're not just focused on reading the phenomenology of spirit, but also applying the phenomenology of spirit to contemporary knowledge and two contemporary problems like this uh, problem of the relationship between continental philosophy and, and cybernetics, um, and building towards actually a conference that will be live streamed on this channel and also hopefully a book. So I think that's just a very good question. Um, Warren the Bard says, to what extent is Hegel comparable to Eastern philosophies of change? Very good question. Um, I think my per I'm my personal view is that Hegel actually deepens and extends the philosophy of change. Um, and in my in in sort of how I've been approaching the science of logic so far, I actually think Hegel kind of dialecticizes the relationship between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Now I know that's the Western tradition, um, but in this dialectic dialecticization of Parmenides and Heraclitus, um, there is a more sophisticated notion of change than what I, what I hear in the Eastern traditions. Because in the Eastern traditions, at least as far, and I'm not an expert on the Eastern traditions. So again, this is a question where I would encourage someone exploring this question in the course. Um, but there's a way in which Hegel's notion of change can deal with events and negativity in a way that I don't see in at least the people who popularize Eastern religions or Eastern philosophies of change. Because Hegel is working in a time that was radically unique. So it's not that Hegel is more intelligent or Hegel is wiser than the Eastern philosophers or the Eastern religions. It's simply that Hegel was writing in a time where there was a massive qualitative rupture in our political social orders, and he developed a philosophy in relationship to that massive political and social rupture, namely the French Revolution. So his notion of change, I think, is capable of going beyond the pre-modern notions. That's that's my short, but it's a very deep question. It's a very, we need a, a long conversation to really unpack that. Um, Warren the I would sorry and I, also on that Warren the Bard I would I would encourage um, exploring the science of logic to really understand Hegel's notion of change. Um, Warren the Bard also asks Yin and Yang is another way to describe dialectics. However, Hegel points towards the fulfillment of absolute spirit as an end, whereas in Taoism the fundamental fact of change is the absolute. All right, so this is another this is another like question where we need a lot like th this is very complex and and I don't want to simplify for the point of a YouTube live stream to like give a definitive answer on the relationship between Eastern philosophy and Hegel it's like something that I would encourage in the course basically like 
if someone was really interested on that question in the course, I would encourage them to explore that. And I would encourage them to present on something like that in the conference that we hold at the end of the course. Um, yeah, and I don't feel like I can answer the question of what is Hegel's fundamental understanding of change in like a two minute soundbite. So I would just encourage you to keep exploring the intersection of those questions. Um, and again, I point towards the science of logic if you want to understand Hegel's understanding of, of change really deeply. Um, and actually, I would recommend there are some lectures by Stephen Hulgate. Uh, last name is spelled H-O-U-L-G-A-T-E uh, on the British Hegelian Society YouTube channel, which are A+. Uh, so check them out. And he specifically dives into the problem of change and the way Hegel conceptualizes change. So uh, very much recommended. Isaiah Holland, what do you know about the formalization of dialectics by William Lavier and the carrying forward of this into string theory by Jörg Schreber? I know nothing about it. I know nothing about it. I've never heard of these uh, characters, these people, these figures. So I don't know. Um, I am very interested, though, in the relationship between dialectics and physics, um, specifically as dialectics could be applied to problems of the way physics communities approach problems of quantum gravity. So I'm in principle very interested in that. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. I never know how to pronounce. Uh, next is from Dr. Kluckenstein. Hello, Dr. Kluckenstein. I never know how to pronounce Koyevi's name. Koyev, Kojev. It's, of course, famous Hegelian. Is Kojevi's reading of the phenomenology faithful to the text? So I have actually read that book. I've read uh, Koyevi's Hegel, even though I can't pronounce his name properly. Uh, I do forgive your stupid name, Dr. Kluckenstein. Uh, but <laughs> so I, uh, specifically, um, to your your question, um, yes, I do think that this is a, a text worth reading. I labored through it. Um, it's an incredibly dense text. As you probably already know, it's a text that influenced Lacan. Um, and Zizek, in particular, uh, is very critical of Lacan's reading of that text and that text itself. But nonetheless, it's worth reading. So as as if, as if for nothing else, as a historical um, text that had an enormous impact, an enormous influence on Lacan's reading of Hegel. So if you want to understand where Lacan's ideas on Hegel come from, you should read that text. Um, and also an interesting side is that Zizek's criticisms of Lacan's interpretation of Hegel stem from that book. So uh, that's the reason why Zizek claims when Lacan goes against Hegel, he actually becomes more Hegelian because I'm not actually sure how deeply Lacan read the original Hegel. So it's an interesting historical book for that purpose. Dimitri asks, why did you choose this particular translation translation of the phenomenology of spirit? That's a good question. Well, the reason I chose this particular translation was was because in the circles I was originally um, reading in like basically the the original circles I was influenced by were reading this reading this uh, translation edition. And I heard positive things about the foreword from J. N. Finley. However, I probably should and probably will in the future read other um, forwards. I would be very interested in reading other forwards. Um, and I would encourage the people, I know, Dimitri, you're taking the course. So I would encourage people taking the course 
um, also to read different editions. I think that can only enrich um, your understanding of the phenomenology of spirit. Um, I don't have a better answer than that. Okay, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name. It's Zibig... I'm going to try and pronounce this name. Zibignu Pisuwish. <laughs> I probably really botched that. Why do the Frankfurter school folk, Adorno et al., renounce fun and joyful stuff like jazz, pop music, and TV entertainment? Do they principally hate life? <laughs> well, that's an interesting point. Um, I would say that the Slovenian school, which is like my main influence in studying Hegel, has been the Slovenian school. And they seem like the opposite of the Frankfurt school in this regard. So Zizek will famously study pop music and TV entertainment and movies and pop culture in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and try to read these phenomena, video games, and try to read these phenomena from the perspective of a Hegel and Lacan. And I think that that is, you know, I think that is an extremely interesting way and also an extremely relatable way um, to bring these old texts to life and to bring these ideas to life. And, and, and so in that sense, I'm actually kind of, you know, methodologically, you might say the opposite of the Frankfurt School, because I do think it's worth, you know, studying pop music and TV entertainment and stuff like that. So maybe I don't know if the Frankfurt School hates life, though. Um, Isaiah Holland asks me, what do you think of Jean Hippolyte's Genesis and Structure? I don't have an opinion on it. I haven't read it. Um, let's see. Max Mackin asks, looking forward to the course, Cadell, when did you find that you understood or came to grips Hegel's POS? Because I've been reading for a while and I feel like it's beyond me. Okay, so this has to do with my method of approaching the phenomenology of spirit, which I'm hoping I will be able to use to guide the people through the guide those who are taking the course through the course. Um... Uh, and I think which is already available on my YouTube channel, which is the, the videos I've already done on it. While I was reading the Phenomenology of Spirit, basically what I did was I first studied the foreword by J.N. Finley, and he gives a sort of structure of the book, his interpretation of the structure of the book, and I wrote that structure down in imagistic form. So I created like image dialogue, image structures, which are basically a series of triads. Um, and that structure helped me to avoid getting lost while I was reading Hegel himself. So, and while I was reading Hegel himself, I was constantly translating him into an image structure of a triadic form. So that was helping me basically make sense of a lot of the dense, like, because the problem with the phenomenon, not the problem with the phenomenology of spirit, but the actual nature of the phenomenology of spirit is its density. It's probably like the densest or one of like the densest texts ever written. Um, and that makes it incredibly difficult to follow sometimes. Um, and also he the way Hegel's writing it is he's constantly, um, proposing something in a logical proposition and then countering it and destroying it and then forgetting about it. So being aware of that method that Hegel's using in his writing is very helpful is he'll propose a logical proposition, which is fully attached to meaning you think it's the truth. And then he'll propose the opposite one and then he'll destroy the other proposition. And then both the propositions are destroyed and then he moves on to a different topic. So it's incredibly it can be disorienting and it can be challenging in that regard. So my short, long, like short answer is, is to make sure that you also are having diagrams and creating images um, to help you understand like the, the symbolic uh, dimension, because otherwise it can become very difficult. And hopefully a lot of like the, the PowerPoint slides and the other stuff I'm preparing for the course 
um, images, um, memes um, will be will be a helpful guide and help people get through it. And I also recommend my YouTube videos, which are which are which are designed in that way to help help people get through the course and to get people through the book. Warren the Bard said, some say that when Lacan abandons Hegel is the moment he becomes Hegelian. Yes. So, yeah. And that's exactly why. The, the reason why is because Lacan probably read Hegel mostly through Koyev, uh, Kojev, or however I have to pronounce that name. So this is basically also another reason why I'm doing the course is because I think it's important to read the original text. I think it's important to actually work through the original work. Uh, and if we have a generation, more and more people um, who have a deep understanding and have actually like committed time and energy and attention and awareness to actually reading the original work, of course, it's in an English translation, but I still think like people who have dedicated themselves to actually like laboring through, you know, Hegel's own thought um, can only make our understanding of the present moment and our capacity to engage seriously and honestly in philosophy today that much more sophisticated, that much more impressive. And I, and I think it, it's necessary today. We do need to become more philosophically uh, rigorous. And I have the impression that so many anti-Hegelians never read Hegel. Like that's my, that's my dominant sort of like, and we need anti-Hegelians anyway. So we need people to go against Hegel. I think Hegel is built in such a way as that he can handle people going against him and even destroying and trying to negate him. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this YouTube name, but Yul Jippy. Can the questions only be related to phenomenology of spirit or just general questions? If you take the course, uh, you can ask, like, I think there's two ways. You can develop a research topic that is directly inspired by the reading of the phenomenology of spirit, or you can bring your own interests and you can bring your own research questions. And as long as you somehow relate it to the phenomenology of spirit, that's sort of the, that's, that's also okay. Dr. Kluckenstein, they hate life within capitalism and it, it, its hold over culture. As Adorno says, wrong life can't be lived rightly. They hate life within capitalism and they hold over, and, it, and it's hold of, yeah, so yeah, uh, okay. Well, I'll take your word for that. Uh, I'm assuming referring to the Frankfurt School. At Zigbignu from Cassandra Kairos. They're all things that supposedly keep people from attaining critical consciousness in short. Um... I guess that's TV entertainment and stuff like that. Okay. Dr. Kluckenstein continued, and Adorno and Horkheimer do study pop culture. They reference Donald Duck and Toscanian. I'm not an, an dialectic of enlightenment. I have, so I haven't, I haven't read the Frankfurt School very closely, so um, I can't comment on that. The comrade asks, have you come in contact with Max Stirner? And if so, does he misrepresent, misunderstand Hegel? I have not come into contact with Max Stirner, so I can't I can't answer that. Samir Karki, what are your tips to understand the book Science of Logic by Hegel? So, okay, so I do have I, I am starting to form opinions on this. I want to preface that I'm starting to form opinions on this because Although I've read parts of the science of logic and I've read about the science of logic and I've watched lectures and, and stuff about the science of logic, I haven't fully given it my time and attention that I have with the phenomenology of spirit. So the first thing I would say is that what I've heard and what sounds logical to me is either you should first work through the phenomenology of spirit thoroughly before starting the science of logic and that's what I'm going to be doing. I've I've worked through the phenomenology of spirit for four years, and then I'm going to move on to the science of logic. Because from what I understand, one should have thoroughly 
moved through the problems of ordinary consciousness, the different forms and stages of the phenomenology of spirit, and sort of have a sort of sense or a, a, a deep felt understanding of what absolute knowing is about before starting and really wrestling with the science of logic. Because as I understand it, science of logic is basically about deriving categories which Kant presupposes as transcendental categories or a priori transcendental categories. So you want to be, and so basically it's like, how does a subject of absolute knowing derive categories? Um, so either really wrestle, really understand the phenomenology of spirit before starting the science of logic, or make sure that you're an individual who has really tested yourself in life through critical, skeptical, you know, through the critical, skeptical faculties. Um, and sort of like feel as though you're someone who's not only just someone who can think logically, but is ready to think logically about logic itself. So uh, that's my, that's where I am at least thinking about it. DJ Isuru Pereira, what would Hegel have thought about deconstruction? I think what Hegel would have thought about deconstruction is that it's too one-sided. It's too one-sided. And like, and basically, like, I don't know if deconstruction, I don't know what the relationship would be between deconstruction and Hegel's notion of reconciliation. Um because in Hegel's notion of reconciliation, it's kind of like we are always already reconciled um, and get conceptual structures fundamentally contradictory. And we're just reckon that's how I understand it. We're fundamentally reconciled with the becoming of a contradictory notion. So I would say like deconstruction has too much of an emphasis on subverting and, you know, being away from the center of power. And I don't know. Um, Perhaps I, I perhaps Hegel would have said deconstruction is not dialectical. Um, but then again, I don't know. Perhaps Hegel would have really liked Derrida. I'm not. But on Derrida. The big new peas in wish again. If attaining critical consciousness necessitates me to abandon my proclivity to indulge in to ephemeral and ecstatic pleasures such as dancing and playing jazz, then it will happily resume to my fate. Yeah, I agree. I think that, yeah, I think that <laughs> dancing, I mean, yeah. You Jippy, any advance, any advice for a first year philosophy undergrad? That's tough. Or just general stuff for 18 year olds. That's tough. So, cause I have like, I'll just give you my perspective on philosophy, which is only to be taken as my perspective. Okay, so I, I just really want to I really want to emphasize that this is only my perspective and it reflects my element. Um, and that is basically that before I was like in my late 20s, I basically stuck to studying science and history. Um, social sciences, natural sciences and history. Um, basically subjects which I see now as training my mind. So like they, they trained me how to think and they trained me how to be rigorous and disciplined and sort of integrate and synthesize knowledge. Um, but in such a way as that it wasn't really about, um, a deep self relation or like my relationship to life and death or my relationship to big metaphysical questions that directly involve my spirit. Um, and then when I sort of started to experience deep existential catastrophes and deep, you know, I started to have even deeper sort of wrestling with religious and philosophical questions. And when I was more mature, like closer to my thirties, I started to get into philosophy 
And I think that that, at least for me, was a good thing because I was sort of like a trained academic mind before getting into philosophy, which which I think was 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 good. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is if you're 18 years old, explore, don't just hyper-focus on, I guess I would say don't just hyper-focus on philosophy. Also sort of expose yourself to what's going on outside of philosophy. Like read read about modern physics. Uh, read, don't just isolate yourself. Read about modern physics. Read about evolutionary science. Um, read about modern social sciences, um, try to read the best stuff, you know, like, like read Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, um, read the, 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 the great books on cybernetics. Um, I guess I would say read the greatest thinkers um, in all the different fields. Um, expose yourself to as many ideas as possible. That's what I would, I would say. Max Mackin, that's great. Thanks for the advice. What would you say is one of the most important and impact, impactful ideas that you found in Hegel's POS? And in what way is our civilization still talking to Hegel? It's hard to pick out one. What I would say about what's the most impactful idea, it's not any thing necessarily that Hegel says, it's more the way he is with knowledge. That's what I would say. It's the way he is with knowledge, meaning that he holds tightly as if he owns, and he lets go as if he never had it. And I think that that's so beautiful. Um, he's capable of articulating the interiority of knowledge the way we really get attached to things and also the way we suffer when we lose things. And as it relates to the world of concepts, I think that Hegel does a good job of articulating the way that attachment and that loss are processed. And that is invaluable for me. Like that helps me practically intimately um, whether that's with like intimate relationships or like my intimate relationship with academic knowledge. So that's really an impactful thing that the phenomenology of spirit has left me with, but it's not like one proposition. If there's one proposition that Hegel said that left a big impact on me, it's probably in the preface. There are so many deep propositions in the preface. Um, one of them being the truth is both substance and subject. I think that's a fantastic axiom. Um, so there's also a few axioms he has about death and the void, which in the preface, which I, which have stuck with me. So that's what I would say. In what way is our civilization still talking to Hegel? I mean, I think a lot of, I think Hegel's coming back, obviously. Hegel's coming back. Hegel's coming back in fashion. Hegel's coming back in style. My view is that that has a lot to do with Zizek's work and Zizek's popularity. At least that's my window into the phenomenon. Um, but I also like some of our times, like he will speak to a certain symptom of our time, I think as it relates to knowledge and truth. So I think if Hegel's coming back in fashion, my view is that the reason why Hegel's coming back in fashion is because of the relationship between knowledge and truth and, and making sure that we understand that. Adorno didn't lift. I lift. The dating theory. Hi, hi, Cadell. I'm enjoying this. Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm enjoying this too. Max Mackin, what is Hegel's concept of spirit in the phenomenology of spirit? I think Hegel's concept of spirit and the phenomenology of spirit is processual. And I think also the negativity of identity. I think spirit is something that can move through different forms of identity as a process and finds its ultimate truth in negativity. That is death. 
That's my understanding of it. Max Mackin, what do you think Hegel would have thought of our age technology and social media in regards to development of human consciousness? That's a really interesting question, Max. So like that's the type of question that I would encourage people to explore in the course. That's the type of question that I would be really interested to hear someone's view on, like who has just had a, like a fresh interpretation of Hegel. And like, that's very relevant to contemporary Hegelian studies, like, and I think an underexplored topic, to be honest. So like, for example, Slavoj Žižek just published a book titled Hegel in a Wired Brain. So also read Hegel in a Wired Brain. Like, how, how can Hegel be approached in the modern technological age? Also, my PhD thesis is on global brain singularity, and the final chapters are increasingly Hegelian. So I think Hegel applied to modern technology and applied to modern social media. These are interesting questions. What would have Hegel thought? Um, they may have challenged his understanding of the dialectical stages in the phenomenology. Because Hegel says, I mean, or Hegel like presents the idea very clearly that the actual stages he runs through in the as the, the stages of the idea in the phenomenology um, are not absolute stages. Like there could be other dialectical processes, but he, basically what he's saying is absolute is absolute knowing. So the question would be how do stages build towards absolute knowing in this age that would be the question like that i would be interested to hear people try to approach okay let's see raul morosan what would you say is the most difficult chapter in the phenomenology of spirit before and after understanding it better that's a good question the longest chapter is the chapter on spirit. I really struggled with the chapter on spirit. So maybe I would say the chapter on spirit. It's the longest and it's tough to get through. I'm going to say that. So I'm, I'm excited actually to go through the chapter on spirit again in this course because maybe I'll have even a new understanding of it after reading it again. Raul Morrison, can you still say that Hegel is a philosophy of process when the role of dialectic is to reveal what was always already there? The trick is that what was always already there can only manifest in a process. So like it's potential if it's not actualized in the process. It's like the way I understand it, it's like a developmental metaphor, um, like kind of like a seed metaphor. Uh, in the preface, Hegel actually uses the metaphor of a, a fetus. A fetus, which I think is really interesting. He says that a fetus or an embryo, he literally says embryo. So like an embryo, he, he says an embryo is in itself, but an adult is not just in itself. It's also for itself, whereas an embryo is not for itself. So it's basically saying that in the state of absolute knowing, what is in itself becomes for itself. That's the, the understanding. Um, and crucially, and this is also crucial, is that the state of absolute knowing, although it's like a qualitative phase transition of knowing itself, it doesn't end process as such, meaning that it's not like everything's done. Like, on the contrary, you could say everything's just beginning um, from the perspective of the knower for itself. Yul Jippy says, any book Rex? Sorry for such a general question. That is a general question. Um, what I would recommend is that you, here's what I recommend. Take a look at every major field of knowledge and pay attention to who founded that field and what books they wrote to found that field. And read those books. So like, I'm doing that with phenomenology of spirit, like phenomenology and like modern philosophy rests on Hegel. So I wanted to read that. 
find the books that are foundational. Find the books that are foundational in cybernetics, in physics, in anthropology, in biology, in religion, theology. Find the books that are foundational and read them and read them deeply. And don't just read them like a tweet or don't just read them like a Snapchat. Like we have attention spans, which are ridiculously short. Turn all that off. Read foundational books for a long time, spend time with them, labor with them. That's what I try to do. Chris, Christoph, I read Hegel's Science of Logic after that, his first encyclopedia. Do you think it is better to read the phenomenology now or the third encyclopedia, which is about the phenomenology? Well, it's all your path, man. I'm, I, I can only share my path, which is I'm starting with the phenomenology and then I'm going to move to the science of logic. But if your path is a different path, explore it how is intuitive to you. Uh, that's the, the, the path that's intuitive to me is I sort of want to get to know Hegel's idea as his idea is developing. So I started with the phenomenology, then going to move to the science of logic, then, then other works. Not that I haven't exposed myself to a knowledge of those other works. It's just that what I mean is like spending like deep time with those works. Um, so that's your call. Raul Morrison, I am reading Observing Reason and it's eating my brain away. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that uh, chapter. The reason chapter is really one of my favorite chap, but like I can say that about many of the chapters, I guess. The preface is unbelievable. Thanks. That's all I want to say. No problem, man. A mod. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Max Mackin, in what way would you say Nietzsche relates to Hegel? Now, I'm going to be talking about that in the first, uh, in the first course, in the first uh, class. I'm going to talk about that because I'm very interested in that. And that's actually where my mind is right now, like in my own work, like because like, it's actually like, you know, when I study Hegel or like when I study other philosophers, like I'm doing also the return to Freud, like that's kind of like my study work. Like, it's like I'm leading like a graduate school course. Right. But I also have my own work. Right. Like this, my like my my own publications like that are, you know, informed by philosophy, but they're like it's quite a separate trajectory. And that's one of the questions that I'm most interested in in my, in my own work. So. I think there's a very interesting relationship between Nietzsche and Hegel, and I'm, I'm interested to explore that. And you'll hear that in the first course, so look forward to that. That's a that's a teaser for those who should sign up for the course. <laughs> Imad, Afebung, you hear, sending you love and warm wishes. <laughs> Great, love to you as well, man. Glad you're enjoying the live stream. I should probably do more. TY, thoughts on Todd McGowan's interpretation of Hegel and the role of contradictions. I have a whole conversation with Todd McGowan on my channel. So go to the podcast conversations. I have everything organized on my YouTube channel. Is My YouTube channel is organized by categories. So go to the f philosophical podcast section. And I have a conversation with Todd McGowan, interviewing him about his fantastic book. So you'll find uh, my relationship to Hegel and the role of contradiction there. My 12-year-old brother plays Fortnite while listening to Twitch. It's really annoying. He is so effed. <laughs> well, Mads. Hey, man, with a big kiss. Hey, Mads. Great, great to have you here, man. Great to have you here. If you have any Hegel questions, just drop them in. Or if you have any other questions in general, I'd be interested to hear from you. Max Mackin, what would you say is Hegel's idea of self-overcoming and self-transformation? Self-overcoming seems to be a big theme in Nietzsche. So, Max, I'm going to point you towards the preface of the phenomenology instead of answering you directly. What I would recommend is either you can watch my video on the preface of Hegel's phenomenology, or you can just dive into the preface yourself, but you're going to get those ideas on Hegel's understanding of self-overcoming and self-transformation in that, in that section. 
Ty, nice. Definitely will check that out. Thanks. Raul Morrison, what's the difference between Hegel's phenomenology and 20th century phenomenology, Ponty, Heidegger, Husserl? So I've only read of, of the of the 20th century phenomenologists, I guess I've read Heidegger the most closely because I'm not like an expert on every philosopher. I'm not. Um, I've read some people very deeply and I've read some people not at all. Uh, Heidegger, I've read more than any other of the phenomenologists. Um, and I'm very interested in the relationship between Hegel and Heidegger. And that's one of the reasons why I had a conversation with Johannes of the, uh, um, you know, Johannes Niederhauser of the Halkion Guild. Uh, and I recommend checking out my conversation with him um, because in that conversation, you're going to see basically a Hegelian and a Heideggerian perspective colliding. Um, and I think hopefully we can have a lot more collisions um between those what i would say is the big difference between hegel and heidegger is the role or the relationship with metaphysics or the concept so like heidegger is very much about getting out of the concept and metaphysical projects and conceptual categories and really grounding things in being in the world whereas hegel's trying to transformation or the becoming of the concept so i think that that's one of the differences um, the relationship between the concept, the way Hegel relates to the concept, and existentialism, that's a big rift as far as I understand it. And that rift starts to open with Kierkegaard. So that's my answer, I guess. What was Hegel's reason for calling Napoleon the world's soul on horseback? Well, okay, so it's like I was saying to Max, one of the presuppositions that sticks with me from Hegel's preface is the absolute is subject and also the absolute is substance and also subject. So like this can be encapsulated in Hegel's understanding of Napoleon is like is like the absolute idea manifests itself in subjects that change that change concrete universality. So, like, from a Hegelian perspective, not just Napoleon, but, like, figures like a Nelson Mandela, figures like a Gandhi, figures like a, a Hitler, figures like a Hitler, fig, figures like a Martin Luther King, figures like a Lenin. Uh, these are figures of the world soul. They are subjects that change concrete universality. This is what Hegel's meaning is, at least my interpretation of it. Christoph, I have a problem with understanding the difference between in itself, for itself and in itself. Wouldn't in itself kind of be like Kant's ding on such thing in itself, which Hegel kind of overcome? So this is, yeah, so this requires a good Hegelian understanding. Like, and th there's, this is really important to understand. And also, like, there's, like, it's very subtle, and it takes some getting used to thinking in a Hegelian way, as opposed to thinking in a Kantian way. So, for Kant, the thing in itself is basically noumenal, in a sense that you can't know it, you can't access it. Um, whereas, for it's not the case. The thing in itself is always already accessible and always with us and actually is very close to it. I also sort of repeat where this as simply as possible. Hopefully I'm not losing my connection. So my internet's being troubling. So basically in the preface of the phenomenology, Hegel uses the example of the embryo as an example of in itself. And then an adult is something that becomes for itself. So 
really the process of becoming of the absolute is the in itself becoming for itself. So this is a dialectical process, and that has to do with knowledge and truth. Um, but yeah, I mean, Hegel does give a very important perspectival shift on Kant's notion of the noumena or the thing in itself. And a lot of my understanding and, and like where I would really push people to understand this, it, it would be to read less than nothing. And I have a, a whole bunch of videos on my channel covering less than nothing by, by Zizek, which really goes into this distinction. So that's, that's where I've really sort of sharpened my understanding of this distinction. Paul Gregory. Hi, what do you think about the relationship between Hegel Herman, hermeneticism or hermeneticism in general? Well, I'm not an expert on, on, on hermeneutics. Um, but one of the things, so I can maybe, I can give a stab at this. I can, I can try to answer this question, but I just want to preface my answering of this question with, I'm not an expert in her hermeneutic. How I understand it is that hermen her that people in hermeneutics are trying to look for meaning in historical texts. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. But what Hegel's saying is, is that the meaning in historical texts is something that's in the present moment of the knower. So everything's in the present moment, really, for Hegel. Just making sure my internet doesn't uh, mess up the stream. Uh, maybe you could further clarify a question on that if I didn't answer that properly, but... Max asks, how does Hegel view art in the development in consciousness? I've been listening and watching to a lot of Arca, who is doing some really groundbreaking post-human and transhuman art. And that's another question that would be really interesting to explore in the course, is Hegel's relationship to art. So what I can say here as a guiding point for you to think about this question would be that Hegel views the absolute idea as a process on the level of art. And remember, absolute is substance and also subject. So art, religion, and philosophy are the absolute ideas becoming. So some subjects will embody the pathway of art. Some subjects will embody the pathway of religion. Some subjects will embody the pathway of philosophy. Right? So that, that maybe is a way to start thinking about that question. And that's, again, a question I would encourage you to explore in the course. Dimitri asks, bro, what would you have, what would, bro, would you say you have absolute knowing? Good question. I would say that I have a certain relationship with absolute knowing. I wouldn't say that I am, a. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a complete subject of absolute knowing though. I wouldn't. I have too many, and, and I would say that my primary block for that is my relationship, my relationship to sexuality, my relationship to intimate relationships. I still think I have things to work on as it relates to absolute knowing. Definitely. So I have huge blocks when it comes to the relationship between spirit and religion. And I have, which is a, which is a part of the, the phenomenology. And I have huge blocks in relationship to the, the relationship between religion and absolute knowing. But I would also say that it's kind of like a fractal. And I have experiences of all the levels. And I do think I have some experience and intimation of absolute knowing. But definitely not there all the time. And in all situations and contexts. Samir, what is God according to Hegel? Yep. So again, I would point you, Samir, towards the preface where Hegel has an actual quote on what he thinks about divine cognition and the life of God. And I will leave you on a search for that part of the preface.
because that's uh, my understanding of Hegel's understanding of God, like in terms of what he thinks, you know, not just in terms of what he says about God in the phenomenology, you know, the process. So I leave you with that. G. Manet. G. Mano. Manet. Do you think Donald Trump is engaged in the dialectic? Yeah, I don't think it's a choice. I don't think, I think we're all a part of the absolute, no one escapes. Everyone's in. Everyone's in. No one can be outside it. Even outside of it, even outside of it, you're inside of it. You can't get out of it. And that's, I think, what people find like totalizing about Hegel. I think that's what people don't like about Hegel is that they can't get out of it. Paul Gregory, I meant the hermetic tradition, but I like that answer. Cool. Jean Monet, do you think we could use the dialectic to become post-race? Hmm. It's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. I do think that we need the dialectic. I think we need the dialectic to think in a new way about race. Definitely. And I think that there are already conversations happening. That there's natural conversations already happening, especially among millennials and younger generations, Gen Z, I don't know, about race, where we need to think differently about race. So I, I do think dialectical thinking about race is important. I'll say that. What would Hegel have to say on society's use of race? I would say that, well, I... It's hard to say what Hegel would. It's hard to say what Hegel, Hegel would say today about race. But thinking like a Hegelian today about race, it's clearly become something of like a religious identity issue. Like we're we're identifying strongly with race in a way that seems different than other times in the past. So I don't know if it's the human sort of struggling with, with contingency and necessity of their body and like really trying to push the limits of the body. Like, because there's, there's, there's like, you know, Hegel always like for Hegel, like the telos of history is freedom. Right. And like, when it comes to the body, you don't choose what body you, you arrive in right you don't choose you don't choose your body you don't choose your skin tone you don't choose your all the facial features you don't choose it's not like we're like a video game avatar right so i think that there's a way in which subjectivity sees this as like a limit on their freedom and they find it to be like constraining in like a bad way um so maybe like the way we're dealing with race is like we're confronting the body and like you know like zizek has some interesting quotes in uh, his book on Deleuze, where he changes Hegel's sort of axiom of the spirit is a bone to the spirit is a genome, you know, like modern genetics, the spirit is a genome. And the question of genetic engineering, like the question of us actually changing and playing around with our biological substrate, like that's a huge question. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's like sort of where my thinking goes on that topic. David Huber, what's the relationship between psychosis and absolute knowledge? That's interesting. So like, I think it's Joseph Campbell. Someone correct me. I hope I'm not wrong on that, but I think it's Joseph Campbell who says that the difference between the psychotic and the mystic is that the psychotic struggles with states of consciousness that the mystic swims in like with joy and stuff like that. I don't know if it points in that direction, but there's certainly something interesting to explore about the relationship and the difference between psychosis and absolute knowledge. I almost want to have like a, a larger conversation about that than just give an answer to that. I will say psychosis is obviously about the four, like in a Lacanian, from a Lacanian perspective, psychosis is about the foreclosure of the primordial signifier. 
And I think absolute knowing is kind of like a reconciliation with the primordial signifier. So that's my answer, I guess. Monet, the painter. I disagree. Okay. Max Mackin, what do you think of Michel Foucault's quote, to truly escape Hegel involves an exact appreciation of the price we have to pay to detach ourselves from him? It's an interesting quote. Um, there's a few interesting quotes about Foucault's relationship to Hegel. Um, I do like thinking, I will say this, like that I do think Hegel should be used as like not a, like, a way like we shouldn't deconstruct Hegel or we shouldn't try to, um, I don't know, negate Hegel. I think we should work through Hegel in a way where he's like a vanishing mediator. At least that's how I think about the phenomenology of spirit. I think it's like something that really trains you to think about your relationship with knowledge and your relationship with knowledge um, and ultimately, in a way that you can, you you don't have to stay with Hegel, so you can detach yourself from Hegel. In the end, at least in the phenomenology, Efron asks, "How does Hegel define God?" Uh, someone else also asks that. Sorry, someone else also asked that question. Um, who was it? Samir. And what I told Samir is that the clearest. I've heard Hegel talk about God from his point of view is in a few passages of the preface where he talks about uh, divine cognition and the life of God. So I will like him, I'll just repeat, to point you in that direction. And I think that you will uh, find some interesting passages about Hegel's relationship to God. And I think that there, I, I really like uh, what he has to say in those passages. Dimitri asks, what is the absolute idea? So the absolute idea is the idea at, is, is one, it's a concrete idea. Uh, meaning that it's not just an abstraction in your head. It's an idea that's actively shaping history. And it's a process. Um, and it's not the idea as such. It's not deconstructible. So you can't get out of it. You have to ultimately work with it. Um, it's like, like, so like the way to think about it, like, or one way to think about it is like, if you think about the United States, or if you think about Christianity, like you as an individual can say, I'm not a nationalist, or you as an individual can say, I'm an atheist, I'm not Christian. But that doesn't change the absolute idea. As, a, as its concrete existence. Namely, like Christianity still exists as a concrete idea. It still shapes history as a concrete idea. Same for United States. It shapes history as a concrete idea, right? It's like, like imagine like, for example, you saying, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in nation states and I don't believe in the boundaries of nation states. And then like, you're at the border crossing between two countries and you try to cross and like border security guards jump on you and knock you down right that's the concrete idea <laughs> it's like it's like uh get you out of your head right like so like like there's a line in the movie blow that really demonstrates that well where johnny depp is saying uh like like basically he's being put johnny depp's character is like being thrown in jail uh for illegal trafficking and he's like, oh, but they're just imaginary lines. And like, we just make up these borders. And he's like, and like the judge is like, well, yeah, well, these imaginary lines are real and you're going to, you're going to prison. So it was like, there's more to be said about that. But do you know something about Deleuze's main counter argument regarding Hegel? I'm new to philosophy and just started to kind of understand Hegel, but I'm not even able to understand what Deleuze's point is. As far as, so I have read some of Deleuze, Anti-Oedipus, Difference and Repetition, and I do think that you should read Deleuze and you should read, 
you should read thinkers that disagree with each other, obviously. And I think that there's very interesting questions at the intersection of reading Deleuze and reading Hegel. Um, and I don't want to just give a simplistic answer that sort of biases you in one direction or another. But I will say that what is at stake in the relationship between Hegel and Deleuze, I do think is dialectical thinking, the importance and the role of dialectical thinking. And the way that we think about the relationship between self and difference. Namely for Hegel, self and difference is always a dialectical mediation. Whereas Deleuze, I think, is looking for something like essential differences, which do not have dialectical mediation. I have my own views on that, but uh, I'll leave you to that. Explore it on your own. Why do you think Alexander Bard is being underappreciated as a thinker? Well, could be for a number of reasons. He's from Sweden. He's not underappreciated in Sweden. He's very popular in Sweden. He has embedded his philosophical thought in the sort of popular culture and the social structure of Sweden. Um, and I wonder how many other thinkers are also underappreciated because of their country and their primary language. You know, because Slavoj Žižek could just as easily find himself in the situation that Bard's in, right? Like, and I wonder how many similar thinkers are in that situation, pr primarily because of, for that reason. So, and let's see, right? Like, because Alexander Bard's career is by no means done or even necessarily at its peak. So... I hope Alexander Bard becomes more appreciated and I recommend people, people read his books, check him out and, uh, or check out his podcast. Max Mackin. Yes. Very good point. Max Mackin. How do you think Hegel departs from and changes the idea and form of philosophy from Kant? Okay. Well, it's kind of like a perspectival shift. So for Kant, like, so Kant critiques the critiques pure reason. So this is a very simple, simple, simplified answer. Kant critiques pure reason, namely that we wind up in antinomies of reason, contradictions of reason. And he says that that limits reason. And Hegel simply thinks that that is the thing in itself. So sit on that idea for a bit. What can Hegel teach us about morality? Hegel can teach us a lot about morality. Um, and I would point you towards the chapters in Spirit, specifically the chapter, chapter Spirit, for what Hegel can teach us about morality. Um, he can teach us that having one big static moral worldview is going to wind you up in what he calls a whole nest of contradictions. That morality is often disconnected from ethical process of experience. So for Hegel, morality has to be connected to ethical process of experience concretely. It can't just be a worldview. Morality can't just be a worldview. And I would just recommend the chapter on spirit to learn what Hegel has to say about morality. Mac Bath, can you say something concerning the relation of natural sciences to Hegel's science of phenomenology? Sure. As Hegel says in the preface of the phenomenology, he conceptualizes the science of the notion. So, so again, like natural, like for Hegel, natural sciences are very ideal. Like physics is very ideal. Chemistry is very ideal. Biology is very ideal. It's not like we're actually the in itself of biology or the in itself of physics, independent of us humans and our ideas. So that's like a starting point for thinking about how like a Hegelian science looks differently. It, we have to think about our own conceptual involvement in nature. Hacken. 
What is Hegel, Hegel's view on a modern constitution democracy? Would he agree that it is fact a theology without God, but still a belief system based on that idea of dialectical thinking? I think that's a, an, an interesting question also that could be explored in the course. That, that those are, That's another type of, of, of thinking. Um, and I would also point you for, for, for thinking about that question. I'm pretty sure I would, yeah, I would point you towards the chapter on spirit in the phenomenology of spirit. So like the chapter on spirit in the phenomenology of spirit is really dealing with the split between the modern democratic state, the secular abstract universal and intimate faith and communal living and, you know, the intimate sphere. Um, and there's really a dialectical paradox there between those two levels where we are really our inability to think those dialectical tensions is where like we've lost sort of like i think some sort of theological or religious foundation for our society so i would point to that chapter on spirit and encourage to keep exploring that question and so forth g monet I had a phone call while you were answering my question. Very interesting take. I noticed that you didn't answer my mm -hmm. previous question, so let me differently. Uh, do you think the left and right are engaged in a Zizekian dialectic? You'd have to clarify what you mean by a Zizekian dialectic and, and, and maybe clarify that question. Max Mackin, Toddy May has some great lectures on Deleuze on YouTube. Mm -hmm. They're great. So check, check out Toddy May. Nordini, what impact has Hegel on Marx? A big impact, because Marx was reading Hegel heavily and developed the dialectical, uh, his own uh, materialist dialectic from Hegel, and uh, basically tried to make Hegel into a political economic project. And many people would say that the way Marx, or at least I would say, the way Marx did that sort of... Um, really transform some presuppositions of Hegelian thinking in a, in a, I think, an incorrect way. But Hegel had a huge impact on Marx. G. Monet, do you see the free market capitalism as a dialectic? Uh, I would see it as like the, well, it, you can analyze it in a dialectical way, like between, for example, use value and exchange value of capital, as Marx did. Um, you could also analyze free market capitalism as the absolute idea. Um, you know, it's universal. It's a concrete universality. Capitalism is a concrete universality that, that just transforms all cultures and transforms all societies. But another interesting question. Fear Blanc. Could you say that Hegel's notion of a non-perfect nature is similar to new materialism that, for example, Maya Su and Zizek represent, radical contingency? Well, I would first say that Zizek is not a new materialist. Uh, Zizek actually, in absolute recoil, explicitly uh, goes against new materialism. And he has chapters going against Maya Su. So I would I would I would recommend to check out the chapter in Less Than Nothing, uh, where he actually directs um, uh, an engagement with Maya Su, and I would recommend reading Absolute Recoil to read the passages where it goes against new materialism. So Samir Karki asks, "What did Hegel think about Buddhism?" Well, uh, I haven't actually read any passages where Hegel directly talks about Buddhism yet. I'm sure there are, and it'd be interesting if you found any, um, what they would be. In the phenomenology, Hegel talks about the religious idea, and he doesn't necessarily talk about any one specific religion in the phenomenology. So, um, which I, that, that's what I appreciate about his chapter on religion, actually, is that he doesn't talk about any one denomination um, but he talks about the religious idea. Um, he talks about the level of religion as an idea. So, yeah, that might be disappointing, but I don't have any uh, anything specific to say about Hegel's specific idea about Buddhism. However, I would say 
that I like many of Zizek's ideas about Buddhism from a Hegelian perspective. Like Zizek has many interpretations of Buddhism from a Hegelian perspective that I think are quite fascinating. So I would recommend, and I would read, my understanding of that comes from less than nothing. So I would recommend that. Paul Gregory, do you think autism and ADHD and the prevalence of both in boys and girls is important to understand? Do you see either as a disability? I think we do have to understand autism and ADHD in their historicity. Namely, that something that's being produced in this time, it has to be understood in the context of this time, this moment. It could be something that was underdiagnosed in the past. It could be something that's being misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed now. I don't think it's helpful to see them as disabilities. I think it's, I don't think it's important. I don't think we should see them as disabilities. I think we should see them as within the framework of some people have said neurodiversity. And I think we should also see them in the context of, yeah, just different cognition. And also like that in some situations, like attention deficit disorder is like, we should also question our social structures. So those are some of my perspectives on that. Christoph, would you say the famous saying that Marx kind of flipped Hegel's dialectics is based on a misunderstanding of Hegel's ontology? I kind of feel like that, or do I miss something important? In a way, Marx, there are some dimensions where Marx does flip Hegel, like, but not like, and that's not necessarily in a good or a bad way. So, uh, some like, there's some things that I would say he does it in a, in a bad way. Like, for example, positing a necessary telos of history, like world communism, that ended up like sort of missing the dialectical process in some, in some way. Um, I mean, another flipping is the idealism and materialism thing, and that's that's complicated. So it's a complex question. It's a complex question. Um, a, a lot of my understanding on it again comes from less than nothing and Zizek's uh, interpretation. So I would I would go to that to learn more about it. There are many there are many interesting papers on that though online. Efron. Do you think Hegel succeeded in his philosophical project with certainty, or are there flaws and weaknesses in his philosophy? Would you say Hegel is the greatest philosopher who ever lived? Um, it's a tough question. <laughs> so are there flaws and weaknesses in his philosophy? Yes. So like, like Hegel, you can't learn everything from Hegel, obviously. You can't learn anything. You can't learn everything from one thinker. You have to read widely. You have to read diversely. At the same time, there are sort of methods that Hegel introduces, which do have a certain universality to them, which I think that we should be teaching universally. So like, I do think that the dialectic has a universal relevance. Um, I do think that absolute knowing also may have a universal relevance. So, of course, there are flaws and weaknesses in his philosophy, but like the weird thing about Hegel's philosophy is that he builds in flaw and weakness as a strength. Like, because he's constantly, co he's constantly contradicting himself. He's constantly going against himself. And that makes him a stronger thinker. Like, because most thinkers don't do that. Like, most thinkers don't try to destroy themselves, basically. Like, he's constantly, he's constantly, like, proposing things and then undermining it, constantly proposing things, then undermining it. And it makes him kind of, like, oddly indestructible in a sense. Like, like, or at least that's my, my sense. Um, and is Hegel the greatest philosopher ever lived? I mean, I don't think Hegel would, would say that about himself. Like, I would say Hegel had just as much respect for Kant. I would say Hegel had just as much respect for, maybe not Kant. <laughs> I think Hegel would have that much respect for Plato and Aristotle, certainly. Um, 
but Hegel certainly in a in a in a quite unique category, like like with with some others, and I think like also Hegel's greatness comes from his historical time, namely he was thinking at a time um, where he was capable of approaching some questions that a thinker like Plato couldn't have. But certainly I would put Hegel in the same category as a Plato for his time. Modify, modify. what is your best argument against Hegel's idea of absolute knowing being the split between self-consciousness and consciousness? Let me get that because there's so many, so it's, it's a loaded question. What is your best argument against Hegel's idea of absolute knowing? So you're saying absolute knowing is the split between self-consciousness. I'm not sure I understand the question. Not sure I understand the question. And I'm pretty sure it's a loaded question. G. Monet. With Hegel's dial, if you re if you reword the question, I'll try to answer it. But I I don't know how to how to approach the question. G. Monet with Hegel's dialectic, it's simple. It does not include Deleuze and Lacan. With Zizek, would you say his dialectic is more complicated or informed? Well, Zizek states quite explicitly that his project is basically to read Hegel through the lens of Lacan and to read Lacan through the lens of Hegel. It's kind of like a he's putting those two thinkers into like a a deep relation, into like its own dialectic. Um, and I do think Zizek's Zizek's dialectic is more complicated. Uh, and more informed. And I think that that is as basically as a consequence of psychoanalysis. It's basically as a consequence of including within the dialectic the unconscious of the subject. And like, I guess you could say like a fundamental critique of Hegel, like, like it's hard for me sometimes to think of like what is a fundamental critique of Hegel. But one of the fundamental critiques of Hegel might be the unconscious. Because Hegel puts truth on the level of consciousness. And like truth is always for consciousness. But like, can Hegel really think the truth of the unconscious? I don't know. This is, that's a like a fundamental question. And like, I would also point you towards Zizek's chapter called The Limits of Hegel in Less Than Nothing. Hakan Froling, why is Hegel viewed as an important contributor to the shift between the classical philosophy to the modern philosophy? Why is Hegel viewed as an important contributor to the shift between classical philosophy and modern philosophy? What is the main difference of his philosophy? Okay, so you can also find that in the preface of the phenomenology. Basically, it has to do with the historicity of the absolute. So, like, that's the simplest question. That's the simplest answer. It has to do with the historicity of the absolute. Classical philosophy tends to view the absolute as, like, transcendental, eternal, in, like, some sort of simplistic, like, non-historical or ahistorical way. And Hegel makes the absolute historical. So that's like very, very crucial. Yuljipi, why does Zizek use Lacan? Well, one, Lacan reads Hegel interestingly. Two, Lacan is really trying to... I mean, almost in a way... I think what Zizek sees in Lacan is a different form of philosophy. Like Lacan himself would not identify as a philosopher, but I think what Zizek sees in Lacan is a different form of philosophy or a different potentiality of philosophy. So like, for example, Alain Badiou would say, 
Elaine Badu would say that you can't really be a philosopher today without understanding Lacan or like philosophy should be re read retroactively through the lens of Lacan. So I think that there's a different form of philosophy that's, that, that Zizek sees in Lacan. G. Manet, I've never voted an American and after reading Hegel's phenomenology and listening to Zizek, how do you vote? <laughs> I'm just going to have to leave that to the uh, abyssal determination of your own self-consciousness. No, 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 no comment. <laughs> Modify. What is your best argument against Hegel's idea of absolute knowing being a split? Wherever that split happens to exist. So... My understanding is that, and I talked about this actually in a conversation with Raven Connolly, which hopefully will be available soon, is that absolute knowing leads to a perspectival shift on split as such. There is a form of integration or there is a form of unity. There is a form of, of simple unity or simple integration that occurs in absolute knowing But that leads to a perspectival shift on split, on split subjectivity. So at least in my understanding. So like the split subjectivity that, that psychoanalysis really works with can, in my view, be brought to a type of unity or brought to a type of integration. But that doesn't get rid of a deeper ontological split, which in my view has a relationship to death or has a relationship to the fact that even in the state of absolute knowing, the process is not over. Things are still changing. You're still in an incredibly complex, chaotic environment. There's still a deep split. <clears throat> but there is a type of integration. There is a type of unity that is, that is possible. And which does characterize the state of absolute knowing. G. Monet, do you have a critique of Zizek on any of ideas? I mean, yeah, I don't agree with Zizek on everything. Um, I mean, probably like the most fundamental is like, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like, it's also hard to like give simplistic critiques. It's hard to give simplistic critiques because it's like whenever I think of a critique, it's always a yes, but. It's like not an, I guess it's not like an absolute critique. I mean, I, I do think that. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say. I don't want to give a simplistic critique. That's the problem. I don't want to give a simplistic critique. I mean, there's some areas on his views on economics, like there's some views on his areas on politics, which I think like they leave me wanting. I'll say that. Like there are many things he says on, on politics and economics that leave me wanting. Um, but at the same time, like Zizek designs his thinking and like Zizek frames his thinking that he really and he says this explicitly, he's really trying to set the subject to work on these problems on their own, right? So like, he's not just someone who's like trying to give you answers. He's more trying to like, he's like operating as a philosopher in a space before answers, almost like to, to disturb you, to get you to think deep, deeply or to get you to think differently or to get you to think a new problem or to think a new frame of reference. Um, but yeah, he leaves me wanting on some, some topics, but I mean, overall, I'm, I'm just massively appreciative to his thought, to be honest. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so we are coming up on like an hour and a half, maybe it's been hour and 40 minutes. So I, I will sort of like now take this time to sort of like, remind you that the Phenomenology of Spirit course starts January 15th. That's two days. The first uh, class will be at 7 p.m. 
Central European time. Um, as of now, I think we have 16 people signed up for the course. So it's a great bunch. It's going to be a very interesting dynamic, I hope. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, any, like my pitch for this course is basically, you know, this, this, uh, ask me anything. <laughs> That's my pitch for the course, basically. Um, that I do think that it's very interesting to think about deep problems of spirituality, religion, science, politics, um, from this philosophical perspective. Um, and I hope the course I've designed is going to really help people move through this book in an honest way and in a deep way. And I think that there are so many thinkers who maybe have critiqued Hegel or have engaged in Hegel in a certain way, which is a little too simplistic. Um, and this course, I hope, will really help people understand the book and like really wrestle with some deep questions and also be able to formulate their own thoughts on the phenomenology of spirit. So I, the link is in the description. The link is in the description. Let me double check. It is. Um, and I encourage all of you to, or any of you who are really interested in this, to sign up. It's going to be every Saturday. Uh, sorry, every other Saturday, starting at 7 p.m. Central European time. There's also a one-on-one -on -one slot where you can work one-on-one -on -one with me on any questions that you have about the phenomenology of spirit. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than that I've wrestled with this book for four plus years and I'm excited about leading, a, leading people through it as well and seeing the types of questions they ask and the types of ways they try to approach these questions. And it's very open-ended. You can approach any topic you want. You can approach any idea you want as long as it's so, somewhat related to Hegel and phenomenology of spirit. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a few more questions here. Let me see if it's somewhat related, but I'm going to wrap up like, I'm definitely going to wrap up by the two hour mark and it's one hour and 42 minutes here. Cause I'm getting also like, it's exhausting to be honest, reading all these questions and stuff. G Monet asks, have you any recommendations on getting into graduate school for philosophy? No, because I didn't actually go to graduate school for philosophy. I studied philosophy as like an autodidact on my own time. I'm self-taught and I like that. And I would recommend that because one of the problems in philosophy is that there are already conceptual boundaries and like, like political lines drawn oftentimes within philosophy. And to be honest with you, I don't think many institutional philosophers would like me I don't know if they would like me. I don't know if they would get along with me. I don't know if they would see me as threatening or what, but I don't have any recommendations for it other than to as long, like my thing when I was in graduate school was that I wanted to make increasingly fewer compromises with the institution. Like I wanted to have freedom and autonomy in the research topics that I developed. So that's what I would recommend to you to as you go deeper into graduate school to have the capacity to have more and more freedom for your self-developed ideas how would you recommend starting to read philosophy as a young 20 year old guy your philosophy is still super hard for me so one i would like something i said earlier is that as a 20 year old guy i would recommend to start reading science and history before reading philosophy I would say start reading philosophy only when it's becoming essential for your self-knowledge. I would say to read widely in the sciences and to read widely in history. And then when you get older, and if you start to encounter like really deep existential problems, start getting into philosophy and start reading philosophy that's like very much in relationship to what you're struggling with.
Um, and if the philosophy I'm doing super hard, then start like, start reading th start reading things that are in your area, like in your like comfort zone, like that challenge you a little bit, but that that aren't like so difficult that they confuse you beyond belief. Um, I, I like a metaphor that David Bowie used about uh, wading out into the waters to the point where your head is just above the water and your toes are just touching the sand, but that you're not drowning and that you're not on the, on the beach. Right. So you want to be, and, and that's going to be unique for everyone. Right. So find your comfort zone and just keep on pushing yourself, but keep on pushing yourself in a, in a, in a, In, in a in a in a in a wise way where you're where you're not going so far that you you drown what do you think of uh, Paul Gregory asked what do you think of Hegel and Zizek's relationship with mysticism so I think a lot of that question at least on Hegel's side can be answered in the preface of the phenomenology um he's against the absolute like Hegel is against the absolute one that's un non-historical and Hegel's also not a romantic in in terms of getting out of language. So like he's in history and he's in language and he's working here. Like what I'm doing right now, what am I doing right now? I'm in language and I'm in his historical process. Like this is where like, like, and like, like whatever missed, like it's basically not trying to, they're not trying to escape history. They're not trying to escape language. They're trying to work within it. And that requires wrestling with certain negative affects that oftentimes I think mystics are trying to obfuscate or cover over. It's more complex, but Again, I would point you towards the preface. And again, there are some lines Hegel has about divine cognition and the life of God, which I think point in that direction. Zizek also has lots of stuff written on that, that topic, but it's more complex. Vigo says, let's say I want to get into Hegel. Hell yes. Yeah, Vigo. Well, there's a course starting January 15th. Isaiah Holland, what do you think about Hegel's metaphysics of mathematics? Uh, Hegel has some pretty strong things to say about mathematics. Again, in the preface, his clearest thoughts on that are, uh, the, clear, the clearest thoughts I've found about that are, are there. Uh, he says that mathematics has a tendency towards basically external cognition and sort of uh, deadening of the concept and external cognition in relationship to proofs and axioms that cover up the void of subjectivity. So I could go further on that, but um, yeah, read the preface. Samir Karki, did Hegel say anything about happiness? What is it? How to achieve it, etc. cetera. Uh, Hegel said happiness is the blank pages of history. So not very interesting. Hegel is, Hegel like basically would be in line with thinkers like not only Zizek, but also like thinkers like Jordan Peterson, where they're basically saying happiness is not like the ultimate telos and goal of life. Happiness is something that can happen to you. Happiness is something that can happen to you as a byproduct, but it's not an end in itself. It's not an end in itself. Hegel's more emphasizing the struggle. <laughs> Vigo Ekman, thank you, Cadell. Zib big new pizwigs. How acquainted are you with the Slovenian Ljubljana school? People like Rosto, Mosnik, Mladen, Dollar, Alenka, Zupanjic. Well, I've I've had lunch with Alenka, and I've met Slavoj once. Um. Yeah, so that that's most of my contact. I had a a chance to meet Mladen Dollar once, but I I I I, I it didn't happen. It didn't happen. But a missed opportunity. But Alenka's great. Uh, I really enjoyed my meeting with her. Um, and the 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 talk, I had coffee with Slavoj. And yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it's Slavoj. So he's a 
I mean, he's quite similar and maybe a little more personal than like in his normal talks or something like, but that that's basically my relation to them. I mean, if there was, <laughs> it's, it's like at the same time, I don't, I think it's a good thing that like, I'm not in any school. Like I I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy being on the outside because I can do what I want and I can develop as I want my own concept. Um, I can move in any direction I want. And I, I like, I like that freedom. It's a little more, unse more insecuring, but yeah. Isaiah Holland, how far into formal logic should one study for Hegel? Well, Hegel's like a, a wholly different beast of logic. I think it's worth studying Aristotle's logic um, before studying Hegel's logic or in relationship to Hegel's logic. That would be an interesting direction to go. Um, and I actually have um, a collaborator and a friend, uh, Mika Leinenin, who I have a conversation with him on my channel about the phenomenology of spirit. And he often also comes to the return to Freud. And uh, he studies Aristotle and Hegel in relationship. So um, I do think that that's a very uh, interesting path to explore. So you might want to consider that. So one hour and 50 minutes, I will again remind you that the course for the Phenomenology of Spirit starts January 15th. And this is a sort of like a little preparation for that and a showcasing of, of Hegelian thought and also like sort of, I guess, a little more personal relationship to myself. I think I should do these Q&As maybe a little bit more. It'd be interesting. There's been so many good questions. There have been so this has been a lot of fun. So thank you to everyone who's asked questions. This has been like a lot more lively and a lot more engaging than I anticipated. So this has been a fun night for me. Thank you all. And um, again, there's about 16 people signed up for the course. There's tier one, which is $300 Canadian. There's tier two which is $500 Canadian tier two, gets you more one-on-one -on -one time with me to develop ideas. The course will be leading to a conference, um, which will be on my channel, and hopefully also a book, an edited book. And there are no limits here with what you can explore, as long as it's somehow related to Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. You know, like whatever pet project you have, whatever ideas you have that you've been working on that are unrelated to necessarily Hegel or necessarily philosophy, if they can be put into some sort of relationship, like there have been so many questions here tonight that are in principle fantastic questions for a paper, fantastic questions to explore and to really sharpen your own understanding of Hegel and to explore new ideas related to modern capitalism, related to modern technological society, uh, you know, related to whatever philosopher you're interested in or whatever thinkers you're interested in. Um, and I think that's going to be a really super dynamic and it's about 16 weeks. So you get like 16 weeks of, 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 of deeper, deeper engagement with me. I've designed a lot of course material that I think is going to be unique. You can't find it anywhere else. Um, it very much just reflects my spirit and my own path and my own relationship to phenomenology of spirit. This is not like a university course in the sense that I give this every year, right? Like this is not something I give you every year. You're very welcome, Modify. And I want to say to Modify in particular, I want to say in the Modify in particular, keep developing your own ideas, man. It does not matter what I think. Keep developing your own ideas. Um, and I love that you are thinking. I love that you're pushing your thought and I love that you're pushing and playing with ideas in unique ways and you're really challenging frameworks and challenging ways of knowing. Just keep on, keep on doing your thing, man. So like to everyone else, um, Yeah, this course is not like a university 
course in the sense that I'm not giving this every year, right? Like this is not like a pre-packaged thing that I'm like giving for the 700th time, right? Like I've seen some university professors give the same course every time, year after year after year after year. And this is not that. Like this is basically I've wrestled with the phenomenology of spirit for four years. I have a unique perspective on it. I have my own relationship to it. Um, and this is sort of like what I want to share with the world, basically. I, I, I think I'm in a place. I think I'm in a situation where I feel comfortable to share my own understanding of this book to others uh, in, a, in a teaching context, in a live teaching context. So that's what it is. So Hekan says, thank you. Very interesting format. And thanks for your ideas. Um, Jean Monet, Monet says, do more AMAs. I probably will. I probably will. Maybe I'll make it like a monthly thing where I do like a monthly AMA. Um, Cause this has been very fun and very interesting. Um, any of you guys who want to help support me outside of the course, I have a Patreon. You can give $1 a month and that helps me a lot. And you can stay in touch with everything I do. I'm very active in the sense that I'm constantly producing things and trying to serve this larger philosophical movement at basically the intersection of philosophy and psychoanalysis, which I think is increasingly important, which is becoming increasingly paradigmatic. I've wrestled with these ideas for a long time. I try to give my own unique personal perspective on, on many challenges. You know, I do a return to Freud. Um, so it's a good way to stay in touch with me. It's a good way to stay in touch with my work. And it's a great way to support um, support uh, online intellectual labor. So, is there a, Isaiah says, is there any way to do a payment plan for the tier two? Yeah, I mean, get in touch with me on email. We can definitely set up a payment plan. Absolutely. Anyone who's like resistant to join the course because of uh, there's no payment plan option. Just email me, get in touch with me, and we can set up some 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 idea for a payment plan. Mads, fun listening. Thank you, Mads. Mads is a good friend. Um, stayed with Mads in Copenhagen a few times. Um, and uh, one of the things I love about this online space and these is like Mads is a good example of a type of relationship that I just. I couldn't have made any other way. And I just love, just love the idea that I can interact with super interesting people from all around the world and potentially meet them in person from time to time. And like, it's just so rich. It's just so rich. It just enriches my life to be able to like connect with people, no matter where the geography, no matter where, you know, the space and, and, um, just connect with people who have the same sort of shared drive and have the same sort of shared passion and, and impulse. And like, I will also say like for the, I, I ran an online course before called the Freudian unconscious course and that court, like the, the group container for that course is still very active. Like I'm still engaged with those people. And that's another thing that I just really appreciate is like, it's such a great opportunity to do these online courses because I can just meet so many interesting people and develop so many relationships that last years and hopefully lifetimes. So I think on that note, I'm going to like wrap, wrap this up. So again, get in touch with me, my email, you'll find it online on the website or either on my philosophy portal website, you can get in contact with me or my other website, cadellast.com. You can get in touch with me. Um, we can set up payment plans if that's what's stopping you from, from joining the course. Uh, and that's it really. So thank you all for making this a very exciting and a very active and a very engaged AMA. I will probably do these maybe like once a month or something like that. Cause it's super fun. I'll just have to like come up with themes and stuff like that for an AMA. And I hope all of you have a good night and maybe I'll see some of you in the Hegel Phenomenology of Spirit course. Peace out.